want to go to Matthew 14, you can. Uh, if you have your own Bible, go there. If you have a device that you use, you can go there on that. If you don't have either one of those, there's Bibles all over this church, all over the chairs. Feel free to pick one up, and um, you, can, you can turn there to Matthew 14. But we won't be there for probably 20, 30 minutes, so just uh, put your finger in it, okay? This is what I want. We're going to study the, the, the miracle of Jesus walking on water, okay, which is incredible. But before we do that, I, wanna, I just want to take a little while on the encouragement of the, of the other leaders in this church to, to just kind of explain this joint to you. Like, I don't, let me just say this. Does, does, anyone, like, does anyone like me, like you drive around, you see these places like um, the Knights of Columbus, Knights of Pythias, like the Rotary Club, the Kiwanis Club, the American Legion, the VFW, and look at these buildings, they're everywhere, right? And go, what the heck is that? Like, what are they even doing there? Like, I'm, I, I don't even know. What is the American Legion? I don't even know. I, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know what the Rotary Club is. I don't know what the Moose Lodge is. The, the, it's a bar. It's a bar. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe Katie knew that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, like, what about this place? Like, here we are. It's Saturday night, right? And, and we should be at the bar, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes. 
Okay, but we want, we're going to be bold, we're going to tell you the truth of what the Bible says. If you don't like it, that's okay. We still want you to know that we love you. You might leave, never come back, but if you walk into this church, I'm telling you right now, you are always going to hear what that book says. If you don't like it, you take it up with the author, not me. Okay, that's just the way it's going Amen. to be. All right, that's the way it's going to be. So we preach through the books of the Bible, we tell you what it says, and then sometimes we preach, we talk about like one of the people in the Bible. Like we spent some time talking about Peter. The life of Peter. Right now, we're, we're going through this series here, Absolute Authority. We're studying the miracles of Jesus Christ. So we, we do that. We just go methodically. That doesn't mean we're Methodist. Methodically through the Bible, and we teach what it says. And because we've done that, some things have happened. Some things have happened. Over the years, this church has been going for about three years. We've had about 100 people, over 100, come to Christ Amen. and be baptized. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, of that uh, 100 plus... Let me just pause. That's awesome, actually. Okay, that's really, really good, okay? That's really good. God is good to us. Uh, but of that, there's probably been about 20, as I look through my list of people that were baptized, about 20 that were kind of renews and never does. You know, talking about renews are like, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm just a slacker. Let's just, let's just put it, that. let's just melt it down. I'm a total slacker. Uh, I, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, but I don't do what this book says. So I got away for a while, but you know, I just want to start afresh, and I want to let you guys all know that I'm a slacker, but I want to be a better slacker, and I want you to all know about it and hold me accountable. And, and we, we celebrate that, right? We celebrate that. And then there's the, 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 the uh, not never does. The never done it. Like, I don't understand that one. Like, that's a hard one for me. The one who's been a Christian for like 460 years and just never got baptized. Like, I don't know why that happens. But it's okay. When and if, right? Just like the non believer, if you want to come and hang out, that's cool. When and if you decide you want to take the dunk, there's the tank right there. So let me just throw it out there, right? If you're a never dunner, okay, let's get rid of that title. And, and next week, I'll have that tank filled with nice, cozy, warm water, okay? Ready for you, slacker, never dunner. And we'll dunk you, okay? And we'll set right then what we do? We'll just celebrate that, right? We'll celebrate that. So that, that's what we do. Now we we baptize people in, in this tub here, we baptize people in the ocean, we baptize people in pools, we baptize people in the old junky garden tub that was at the old place at the, at the Methodist. We love that thing, right? A lot of us, that's where it all began. We baptize people in all kinds of places, which is cool. Uh, if that thing's not full and you're like inspired one night, we get a bathtub in there. We can baptize you right down in there. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait, okay? So we see some real life-changing events here in our church. Um, also, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to make light of this. We've had a couple of weddings uh, over the last year or so. Kyle and Jamie got married. Uh, Philip and Angela got married, right? Uh, yeah, that's good. Hannah and Troy got married. Not sure Woo! Yeah, they're not here, but they're in Georgia. He's serving in the army. Um, but it's neat to see what God's doing. Like, and don't make, don't think that that's like a little thing, okay? God made men and women in His image to be like Him, both man and woman. And so when they come together, when God brings them together, you see a better representation of the character of Jesus Christ in a couple, like awesome, awesome, awesomer, awesomer. Okay, so you see God more. So let's not make light of that. That's a big thing. Another life-changing event, okay? Amen, right? Um, we have lots of babies. We've got tons of babies born in this church. Like uh, the, the last one, you know, the Jameson Christian Aiden run. We remember them, right? Love them. They're sweet. We've got a new run. We've got a new run. It's kind of crazy. we got Jackson. we got Lucas. we got Alexander. we got Faith. we got Bentley. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm so desperate to want to introduce you. There's a, there's a couple that's coming out on Sunday. I've known them for, for several years. Um, Brandon and Whitney. Um, they, he, she walked in last week with a plain big old fat diamond on her finger, right? Pregnant, they're having twin boys in a couple of months, so that's awesome, right? So we get to celebrate that. We get to, so God's just doing a lot of great things in our church, okay? It's a family, and he's growing his church, and there's a lot of different ways that he, that he does that. Now I want to, I want to um, talk about this, this move that we made here. This move has been good, bad, uh, whatever, we talk about it. Um, we were at that old place over in, in Leesburg, which was an awesome place. We worked diligently to make it. We set it up just the way we thought God wanted us to set it up. It was a great place. Tons of people got saved. Tons of people got baptized. The band grew there. The family grew there. It was an awesome place. We, 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 we brought the wagons around the fire, and, and, and we did a lot of projects together, including this brand new roof that we left the, the next week. I mean, we built a sound studio. We left the two weeks later, three weeks later. Like, we did a lot of things. 
Uh, but really, here's the thing with that building. That building was a way for God to unite this family. Okay? That's what happened. We didn't put on a roof, did we, Pete? No, we didn't put on a roof. Okay? We, we built a family. God built a family here as we work side by side to build. To put that roof on, it builds relationships. It doesn't matter whether we're digging ditches or putting roofs on. We are building relationships with one another, and that's what we did. So we had this building, and we all loved it. You guys all, I love that place. So, uh, listen, the people that went to church their whole life, y'all hated it. Didn't. Don't have to say anything. You hated it. No. You hated it. Come on, I've heard it. I've heard it. Maybe not you personally, but I've heard it. You hated it, right? <laughs> but you love this place, right? You yeah. love this place. You wait for the boat to come walking out over there, right? It's kind of, this place is awesome, right? Yeah, but the people that don't like church, they hate this place, okay? Let's face it. Okay, when we moved, we moved. We have different reasons why we moved. We moved, first and foremost, of course, we had issues with the county. You know this, okay? Since the beginning, they wanted 10,000 gallon water tanks and sprinkler systems and fire escapes. And we would have spent 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars to make this building uh, user friendly for us. But here, here's the thing it didn't matter what we did. Because if you were there the last couple months, you know that we were just, let's just be honest, we were, we were illegal on the kids, right? We were illegal on the kids. We, poor Miss Paula, she's back there dying, right? She's getting over us like Jumanji in the nursery, right? She's got eight kids in there in a room that's the size of the stage, okay? And then upstairs, another room the size of the stage, it's 10, 12, sometimes 15, I mean, it's just a great problem to have. Great problem to have, but that was the problem. So, the, so all these things come together. The lease runs out, the county, the kids all come together at this perfect time, and it's just like, you know what, we can just go. So we left and we came here. We came here. Now, here's, some, here's one of the neat things about this place. Yes, it's bigger. Yes, we have more room for the kids. Yes, we have more room for you. All that kind of stuff. It is a neat, cool place, and we're working on it to make it cooler, 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 and friendly for you, and you want to enjoy it, and we want that to, to be the case. So we're working on that. Um, but here's the beautiful thing about this place. You remember when we were at the Methodist Church? Yeah. Now we were at the Methodist. Now don't, God bless those people. Okay, come on. Okay. As much as I rip on denominations, okay, they, that, Pastor John and those folks over there are so nice. It's ridiculous. Okay, we lived there for over two years without having to pay a dollar in rent. Not a dollar in rent. And then they, on top of that, they like let us use their, their supplies and stuff for the kids. Just amazing blessing. You know what they were doing? They were open-handed with their resources. As God poured out on them, they poured out on us. So that the kingdom of God, they were like, you know that if, if they didn't do this, you wouldn't be sitting there. Right All this whole room of people, this wouldn't be. What if? Right? What if they didn't? It wouldn't be. This is beautiful. And what they did was beautiful. But one of the beautiful things about coming to this place rather than the little place in Leesburg is that now we get to do that now. Okay, y'all, Pastor Pete and his wife, Dazel, they run a food shelter here in Eustis. Every Wednesday, you want to see, you want to see the, where the rubber meets the road? You go down um, across 19, where Lakeshore begins, okay, and look in that printing house where they do t-shirts and, and whatever, okay, behind it, there'll be hundreds of people. Hundreds of people that have no food, and they go to Pete and his wife and these guys, and they get food, and they feed them, okay? They feed them. That's who these people are. And so they needed a place to come and gather and do this with those people, and you know what they were doing? They were meeting in their driveway across the street over here at the house. And so we opened up our church just very much like the Methodist church did. For us, we have now been blessed with the opportunity to live open-handed as well and bless them by letting them come here. So now on Sunday night, they get to come here and they get to worship God together in this beautiful place. Wow. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome, okay? So that, that's what we're doing. Now, let's talk a little bit about this um, this name change. We came over here, and the name change was for several reasons, okay? And I don't want to go too deep into it, but the name change, just this change from SNL Church to Revolution Church. Let me, let me start by saying this, okay? We are SNL Church. That's the name of, of this corporation. It, it will, that's the DNA in this church, okay? We are the church where scumbags are welcome. Let me, let me just tell you what I'm talking about. Okay. First and foremost, I want to I explain that story to you because I think a lot of you get it. 
a little bit mixed up, a little tweet. Okay? Jesus never called them scumbags. You know, he never called them scum. You're not scumbags. Religious people think you are. Jesus doesn't. Jesus loves you. He said, I came to save those who the religious folks were calling scum. I say, I came for you. You come to me. I love you. Okay? That's the church that we were endeavoring to be, to be representatives of Christ in the right way. But listen, it's not a place. It's not a seat. It's not a floor. It's not a television. It's an attitude. It's a heart condition. When someone walks in that front door that, that may be marginalized in our society, we need to embrace them. We need to love them. I don't care if they come in with a heroin needle coming out of their arm. You need to embrace them. Careful the needle. But you need to hug them. Okay? If two girls come in holding hands, you need to hug them. If two dudes come in holding hands, okay? But you need to hug them. Okay? You need to hug them. We need to love the churches that don't love them, we, as long as I live, that's this church, okay? I don't care what the name is. I don't care if we move out of this place because it gets too small and buy a mall. It doesn't make any difference. That attitude must stay with this church forever, okay? That's what it's going to be. This is SNL Church, but with a new name. The reason for the new name is this. Revolution is a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. It's a call to his people to rise higher, to literally open this book, read what it says, and not be afraid to do what it says. Be courageous, be bold, do what it says, and trust that God will bring the increase. That's what we need to do, okay? It's a, it's a call to a group of people that say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of the devil just running this world into the ground, destroying people's lives with, with drinking and drugs and sex and sports and profession and career and money and all this stuff and trying to throw out our problems, and it never works. And so we need to be the first, the people. Sorry for spitting on you. I should have told you. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Santa. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but that, that's kind of church we're supposed to be. We're the church, right, that just says, you know what? I know what everybody else is doing. And I know that the, that the devil, Satan himself, is just destroying lives and destroying families and destroying companies and destroying churches. But we're not going to be that people. We're, we're not going to be those people. We're not going to try other stuff. Like, this is it. This is it. This is what we're going to do. And so this name re it reflects that attitude, that we are going to be those type of people. Okay? That's who we are. Let me talk about these types of people. Let me just tell you, I'm going to refresh your memory about some of the things that go on here in this church. Okay? I want to explain to this place. Do you know that we have no formal youth group? Are you all aware of that? No. Churches have a youth group, right? Most churches in America, they have a youth pastor, they have a youth group. You know this, right? Maybe. If not, you just got told. Okay? We don't have one. I was discouraged at first. I said, man, this stinks. But let me tell you something about the young people in this church, okay? They love Jesus. They don't need me to tell them to love Jesus. And they just gather text messaging, phone calls, emails, Facebook, whatever it is that they do. And they gather once, twice a week at random places without being provoked, without being told, without being ruled over, without saying we're going to meet every Wednesday from 6 to 9, and we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and and you will stop having sex, and you will not drink, and you will not come to my church. That's how it happens here. Okay? These guys just get together. They go to like one flight up. They go into the park. They kick us out of our house. They take over my house. And they do a, they do a devotion. They do a Bible study. And, and then I come home there, and they're in my living room holding hands, praying. And then, you know what they do? Then they go around my neighborhood, and they collect food for Deliver the Difference by the van full. That, that's, that's our young, I don't want to call it youth. It's just the young people in this church. This is what God is doing in this body. He's just inspiring people to love and good deeds. And so I'm just proud of them. We could take a page out of their ministry. That's yeah, you could. It was, what's that? Yeah, you could. Step it up. <laughs> It was awesome. Okay? Here's, the, here's another thing. This was about 10 weeks ago we started something here at this church. Now, I mentioned this before. I mentioned it again. For those of you that don't make this church a, a normal occurrence, you're here on a good night. Look around this church and look at the inordinate amount of men sitting in this church. 
Relax, ladies. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Okay? There's a lot of men in this church. That's not common. Usually, a wife has to drag her, her husband to church. He doesn't want to go. But there's a lot of men in this church. There's a lot of young men in this church. And so, someone in this church, um, we started this thing called 33. It's a DVD based curriculum. It's the, it's the, it's the what is it? The, the journey for authentic manhood, the quest for authentic manhood. Okay, and so this, this thing, there's like 20 to 30 guys that show up every Tuesday night. And, and, we, and we do this thing where it teaches men in this church uh, to, to be Christian men, to be revolutionaries. To stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to be a good father, I'm going to be a good husband, I'm going to be a good employee, I'm going to be a leader of my church, I'm going to lead my family in prayer, I'm going to take care of my kids. Like, I, that's the kind of people that are in this church. That's what God's doing in the men of this church. And if you're not part of that thing, you need to make it a part of your week, every single week. What it's done is it's caused the men in this church, the certain men in this church, that have stepped in and taken on a leadership position to, to, to facilitate this thing and to pray over this, to pray for all of us, and to initiate this program in the church. And it's also allowed all of the men that are coming to do these four things. This is the, these are the four main points of this series. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not the only one who will tell you this, it is working. It is working. We are to reject passivity. We are to accept responsibility. We are to lead courageously. And we are to invest eternally. This, this is real life change. This is not high and holy stuff. Okay. This is men being men. Clearly identifying who God has made you to be and the role that you're supposed to play in this world. And it works. Okay. This is real, true life change. This is leaving a legacy so that when all the men that are in this class are long gone, okay, that the people in this community knew that the men of this church, the church here, Revolution Church, we were different. We were good men. We were good husbands. We were good fathers. I don't want Jackson in there like I was a couple weeks ago in my small group, and we went around the circle, and, and every one of us said, we said about our dads what they did and what they didn't do. Okay. Not a single one of us, I think there's eight or nine men in my small group, ever said the words that their dad told them about Jesus. Not one. And I don't want to be the one. I don't want my kid in there saying that my dad was jacked up and he sucked. And he never told me about how to balance a checkbook, how to fix a car, how to, how to pray, about going to church, about serving, about loving, about being a good husband, being a good friend. Well, all that kind of stuff that a man does. I don't want to be that guy. And this church is filled with men that don't want to be that guy. And this series is changing us. And I welcome you to come and be a part of that. Here's another thing that's going on in our church. Um, I guess when I say past failures, past failures on my behalf. Um, coupled with a, a renewed conviction about making disciples rather than decisions. Okay, that's a big thing in here in our church. So what we've done um, over the last couple months, countless hours spent putting this together right here. Okay, what this is, this is called foundation. Okay, this is, I hate to institutionalize things. I hate to make things so rigid and, 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 and cookie cutter. But listen, there are a lot of people in this church that, that come to this church because they don't want to go to any other church. They don't feel comfortable welcome there, and you're here now. And I don't like seeing people out here that don't know anything about the Bible, don't know anything about Jesus, don't know anything about nothing spiritually about the Lord. Nothing, just nothing, okay? So this is what we've done. We put together this thing right here. And it's tons of quality information. So when you get done with this, you're going to know God real good. Is that even proper English? No. Yeah. But it works, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're going to know God real good if you get through this. Listen, there's people in this church that are going to offer this to you. But if you want to know God real good, so you have a you have a deeper relationship with this one you call Jesus, your Savior. Like if you want to know who he is, I want you to do me a favor. Don't wait. Come see me. See Kyle. See Kelly. See Cindy. Or see my wife, Mary. Okay? And we will make time. We will make time in our schedule every week to sit with you and cover the class.
claims. And then what the Bible says to support those claims so you will know Jesus and you will know him well. So we want to offer that to you. So we don't have a church filled with people who have made a decision. We want to see a church that's filled with the disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's what we want to do. Here's another thing we're working on. You guys notice over the last two, three years how many musicians have come to this church? Yes, sir. I, it's never the same group. You have the same group. A lot of musicians. And a lot of them aren't even here tonight. But they rotate through here. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of people in this church that want to make music for the Lord. <coughs> it's just weird. They don't, there's no place to really do it around here. And so we want to, we want, we want to um, when God gifts somebody, it's to edify the body of Christ, right? It's to build up the church, right? If you have any gifting at all, it's not for yourself. It's, it's not for your wife or husband. It's just, it's for the building up of the church. There's a lot of musicians in this church. And we want to give them every opportunity to take that gift and use it to the best of their ability. Give them every opportunity. Give them a, an environment that they can be creative and, and use their music to advance the kingdom of God. That's what we want to do. We want to start revolution music. We, this is what we, we're thinking about doing. I'm going to throw this out to you, okay? You know Kyle likes to build stuff, right? <laughs> he wants... We, this is what we want to do. Well, we want to do it. He wants to build it. I don't want to build it, okay? But I'm, I'm sure I'll be there if we do it. He wants to build a building in this parking lot over here. Kind of where the swing set is. We'll move the swing set. We'll look at a big building. Like a thing that he used to kind of live in. Like a big 20 by 20 big thing. And put a recording studio in there, okay? He wants to build it out. Foam the walls, soundproof it, put the equipment in there, put couches. You know, these musicians, that's all they do is they sit on the couch. You know that, right? <laughs> Someone writes music for them, and then they get up like little robots and they sing after they sat on the couch all day. So we're going to put couches in there. We want to, this is, so he wants to build this thing, but it's probably going to cost four grand plus. Five, five grand plus or up to five. So whatever, five grand. Okay, yeah, we don't have that to spend. But I'm just going to tell you this right now, okay? Someone's already offered to put $1,000 to it because they believe that that's where God wants this ministry to go, to use music that he's brought us here for. It's not just to put together a nice little set for you all every week. Like, that's good, but I think there's more than that here. I think there's more than that here. And so someone has donated $1,000 towards the building of that project, and this is what I want to do. I want you to be thinking about it. I want you to think about this. And if you believe that that is what God wants this church to do, and you want to partner in that, we're going to take a separate offering next week. You don't have to participate. You don't have to put a stick and nickel in that thing. But if you do believe that that's what God wants this church to do, and you do believe that he is wanting you to participate in that, then you can give. That's nothing to do with the normal offerings that we pay just for the, for the, for the kingdom. Okay? But this is a totally separate thing. So think about it, pray about it, and then next week we'll give you the opportunity to, to partner in that if you so desire. Um, here's another thing. I'm going to make people mad now. Um, everybody has their own style. Everybody has their own style. Everyone in this place, whether you want to say it or not, you have an idea of how you want your church to run. Think this is the way to do it. Everyone has their opinion, so do I. Okay? Um, some people really like this joint. Some people really hate this joint. Um, I don't really care. I don't care. We do it in a field. I really don't care. Got you, got Bible, got God. I'm good. Right? <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you love someone, if you truly love somebody, and you like Paul, you become all things to all people that they might get saved. You will do anything you can, anything that you can, that they might know Jesus. Paul said, if, if I do every single religious thing on the list, but if I don't love, I am nothing. Jesus' brother James, he said, faith without good works is what? You can believe in Jesus, you can love church, you can love me, you can love her, you can... It, but listen, if you don't love everyone, 
If you won't sacrifice of your own to please someone else's senses that they might get to know Jesus, we get nothing. So this is the deal. We're going to see some changes around here. You've already seen some. You've noticed, okay? You're going to see some changes around here, okay? Because we're going to learn to love people. And we're going to do things in our church that you might not like. It's nothing to do with Bible. That's not changing, okay? But the style, the atmosphere, the environment, I want, listen, are you guys with me? I want this place to be a place where you just love going. I don't even know, you might not even believe in Jesus, but I just like going here. It's fun, right? It's just fun. I like it. The, the people are nice. It's comfy. It's cozy. The, the coffee's nice and tasty, right? The music is good. The air conditioning's cold. The couches are comfy. I mean, that, that's just what, that's just the place it is. Like, I would, I'd want to start there, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what else? Would you rather them go to the bar? Would you rather them get, go to the bar tonight and get hammered? Or just come here, even if they didn't believe in Jesus? I want them to come here. And, and then once they come here for a little while, and I don't do this, I do the Bible thing that we normally do, they're going to hear the message of the gospel. And you know what? It's going to sink in. Because the Word of God is power. It sinks in. Whether you want it to or not, it's sinking in, bro. It's sinking in. And so we're going to create an environment that's comfortable and cozy where, you know what, you're going to go to your non-believing friends and say, you know what, just come to this place. It's so awesome. Just want to meet some awesome folks. Just a great place. Come hang out. Let's just go out and party. And just want to make a place like that. So this is what we're going to do. You see this? Got the tables in here again. Okay, we're gonna we're, we're, we're put, we're gonna put some more couches in. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start doing this. We're gonna start piping in the next couple weeks. We're gonna start piping the sermon live into that room on the big screen. So you can, if you don't like this, if you feel like this is too churchy and you just hate it because the the floor creaks every time you move, and everyone's looking at me, I gotta move around it's so bad, but I, don't, I can't because like everyone's gonna look at me because the floor's creaking, right? So like if you hate it in here, I feel you. Now you can sit there, put your feet up, we're going to get a coffee table, and you can put your feet up in there, drink a cup of coffee, and you can watch my LT mug in there, okay? And, and you can bring your friends. If you like that style, you can do that. That's totally fine, too, okay? So we're just going to try to do some things in here to make it very comfortable for all people, okay? Um, here, here's another thing I want to cover with you, because a lot of people have asked me about it. Do you remember a while back, um, because of our love for people, and because we so desperately want them to know Jesus, but we wanted to get people here that couldn't come because they lost their license or they couldn't afford gas. So someone donated a van to this church. Do you remember that? And some of you actually paid toward getting that thing registered and titled and fixed. Okay? I appreciate that. But here's the thing with the van. I'm just going to be honest with you, all right? Jared, y'all know Jared. Jared Shaniko, right? Jared fixed his cars. Dr. J, he's awesome. Okay? He, he started working on it. And this, these people donated it to us. And so Jared took it. He's going to work on it. And we thought it was just a motor thing. We started driving it. It's a transmission thing. We got a big transmission problem. And Jared's been honest. He's like, Moses, I'll fix it. I'm Dr. J. I can fix anything. But it's going to cost you guys. This thing's got a lot of miles, and it's got a training problem. And his, his recommendation, and I don't know everything about cars, right? So he does. That's his thing. He said, I would not fix it. Do not waste their money on this car. But I can sell it. Someone will fix it. It will be a good van for them. But for us, it's not. So he thinks he can sell it. I don't know how much. I have no idea. But for those that have given toward it, I deeply apologize. Didn't see it coming. Uh, he's going to sell it. And we'll use that money for something quality. I, I don't know. Maybe we'll use it towards the music studio. If you guys want to do it, maybe we won't. I don't know. Uh, but I just want to let you know what the story is with that van. Because a lot of people have asked about it. Um, I don't want to touch on this too. A lot of people um, don't know this because you weren't here. This church, um, we, we love to talk about Acts chapter 2 where all the believers met together all the time and they were devoted to the fellowship and they were devoted to prayer and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the word of God. Okay? They were devoted to that. They were devoted to getting together and eating and just hanging out with each other, living life together. We have 17 connection points in this church. 17 times you have an opportunity to gather with other people in this church to deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ and deepen your relationship with each other. Whether it's a one-on-one -on -one discipling process or whether it's this right here or a
men's group or a ladies group or the young adults get together, whatever it is, there's 17 opportunities for you to connect into community so you can make real, lasting, and meaningful relationships with each other, okay? So I want you to try to plug into that. If you want to know more about those things, fill out one of those cards, put it in the offering box, and we'll let you know about them, okay? Um, I want to let you know also, kind of throwing them out here, but Kyle and Jamie started going to uh, a class called Crown Ministries. Crown Ministries um, is, a, is a ministry that helps people, based on the scriptures, be uh, financially uh, responsible and good stewards of that which God has given them financially, and how to run their life financially in a, with a Christian perspective for, for the utmost of success, okay? And so they are taking this class. The reason why they're taking this class is be, not because they want to straighten their checkbook. Now, that's a good thing, right? The reason why they're taking this class is because they love Jesus and they love you. And so when they get done with this class, they want to present that same information to you because there's a lot of people in this church that do struggle financially. And you go going every month, man, I make this much money and my bills are here, but I'm broke. Why? There's a leak and they'll help you find it. They'll help you find it. So you can be more generous in your giving towards the kingdom. So you can help more people. And so you're not stressing about money all the time. They want to help people with that. Okay, so we're going to be doing that too. Um, let's talk about this. We do have a lot of children. And so um, we, want to, we want to start a new system here. Because uh, we know everybody. That's awesome. We do. We know you all. That's great. But a lot of people that come in, we don't know everybody. We want to have a secure, safe children's check-in system so that everyone leaves with the right kid, right? Amen. I see how you look at my babies, and, and I'm, 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 putting up, I'm putting up a fence, okay? We're, we're going to have a check-in system, and that's what we're going to talk about after church, okay? We're going to have a check-in system, and we, here's the bottom line is we want to do this because we want to create an environment where we can best partner with parents to begin a deep and lasting love affair with your children and Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do in this church, okay? And that's why these ladies raise their hand to teach your children, because they love Jesus, and they love you, and they love their, your children, and we want to partner. Listen, we're not here to do all the work. We're here to partner with you in teaching your children to have a lasting love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is what we're going to do. Now let's talk about the worst part of all, okay? and then we're going to jump into our Bibles. Yeah. I'm excited about that one, right? Woo! Yeah. I'm not asking you to give it. So that you can breathe now. Let's talk about money. Because you should know. The reason why I'm doing this is we did a family in our church. This is awesome. You wonder why people leave churches? Uh, a couple months ago, I stood up here and I said, man, if, if, if the offer doesn't get better, we're not even going to stay open around here. <coughs> Just kind of been passing. Then they stopped coming. So one of the people in the church went to go visit him, and they were like, oh, we thought you were closing, so we went to find another church. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Don't help. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go bleed off that one. Okay. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I just kidding. So here's the thing. Our, our bank account runs anywhere from between six and $7,000 over the last probably year. That's, and that's about what we have. Um, just to let you know what we have in the bank. And if you ever want to know what's in the bank to the dollar, See Kyle, he'll tell you, okay? He takes care of the things. You guys pay me. Um, for many years you did not, but now you pay me 24 grand a year. That's my pay. Um, Kyle gets paid also as our worship leader and associate pastor. He gets paid $9,600 a year, okay? Um, just to give you an idea of where we stand, uh, the average church in America is about 75 people, which is what, what you're sitting in. Uh, here's the wacky thing about the internet. You go to the internet and find out average salaries, and it's such a like a massive, like a grand canyon between the numbers. Salary.com says that the average um, salary for pastor in America is 87,180. I don't know where you get that one. <laughs> but it's a little, a little high. The National Association of Church Business Administrators said it's 28,000 a year. I think that's probably more accurate. But either way, you know, there's a $50,000 difference there, but somewhere in the middle, I guess, is probably the accurate number. But um, you pay me 24. Now, the reason I'm not saying this is so you can give me a raise. Okay? I'm not asking a raise. I want to just lay this before you that I could not be more thankful for what you give me in my family. You guys pay for us to live. Okay? I was just sitting with my wife the other day, reflecting on how just so thankful I am that I don't worry about my bills. You, just, you, no, I can't, I can't do it. 
I can't begin to tell you how fortunate I am. And so I thank you so very much for allowing me the privilege to be able to do that. Um, our rent here at this building is $1,750. Electric runs around $250 on average. We pay for our dumpster, we pay for cable, we pay for insurance for the building. Um, we have uh, lots of media, we have apps, and they're free. Someone donates, a friend of mine, he donates the service, he runs the company, the website, free. Someone else took care of it, you don't have to. The phone number for the church, it's free, but it's not someone in your church pays for it, but you don't have to buy it. Okay? So that's where the money goes, okay? I just want you to know where it goes, so we're open and transparent. If you have any questions further, just you can see me afterwards if you'd like, and I'd like to go there with you. Remember our buddy Holy? We're coming to the end of the year, Holy. We committed to sponsoring this little cute little dude in God for a year for $38 a month. We're coming to the end of the, of, of the year. I'd like to just know right now if you guys would like to continue that. Show me your hands if you'd like to continue to sponsor Holy. That's a resounding yes. Okay? It's $38 a month. I'm going to come up with another sign up sheet next week. If you want to put your name down to sponsor him for the next year, I want to challenge you. Okay? I don't think we should ever be stale. I think it's great what we've done to, to pay for his education, pay, pay for his school, and make sure he knows Jesus and pay for his home and all that kind of stuff and helps his family. This little poor kid in Ghana, I think it's awesome. I, I think that we should not go stale. I think that if we just continue the next year with Holy, I think we're going stale. I think we need to take a page out of the Methodist book. Okay, we need to live open-handed. I think that we should I think we should sponsor another child. I think we should up it every year another child. I think we should go for it. I think we should do another child. I think we should go find Paul Compassion and find another child somewhere in this world that needs the help of Revolution Church, and we would give from our generosity. We would give. Would you guys want me to do that? Do you want to present? Can I see a show of hands? Should we sponsor another child and make it two? Yeah. That's a 50-50. Come on, guys. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Yes? Yes? Okay, we'll do that. Now, we'll, make, we'll get another lesson for you to, to help with that. Um, here's another thing. Uh, the leadership got together the other day. You guys all know Zach and Amber. Um, Asa, Monica, Trillian, uh, Tira, Zach and Amber. You all know them? You know them? All of you? Okay, they got, they got a house over in Lady Lake. They moved in there. They've been working cats and dogs like crazy, 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 crazy for weeks to get this place ready. And their roof is leaking like a sieve. Okay? If you don't love, you got nothing. Okay? And Pete sent one of his guys from Bone Dry Roofing over there to check out the roof. It is not going to be fixed. It cannot be fixed. They need a new roof. So we have decided to partner with Bone Dry Roof to completely fund putting a new roof on their house. Okay? What that means to you guys is this. We need to come up with about 500 bucks out of our bank account, and Bone Dry Roofing will partner with them and take care of the rest of the expense of the supplies. Okay? You guys cool with this? But here's what we really need. Pick your hands up. We need these. Okay? Before we leave, if you're interested, we don't put you on the spot. Because I don't know when the good time to do it, but I know it's going to rain soon and they need a roof. If you would be willing to help, it's a what, two day project if we get 10 guys? We'll knock it out, right? That's it. If you would be willing to show your love, even to people you don't know, out of gratitude for what Christ has done for you, would you see me before you leave today and offer your service, offer your hands? Would you do that, please? So that's another thing. Please don't forget. So we're going to do that. Okay, we're going to be, uh, because we love and we want you to feel comfortable, we want people to come here and feel welcomed and loved in a place that they just want to come and, and hang out with good people and get to know this God that we love and serve. We're going to add another two, I think it's a two-ton unit, isn't it? Two-ton from your house, that oh, AC, yeah. two, three, I don't know. Another AC unit, right? Yeah. And we're going to install it here because we want the sanctuary to be a little bit cooler. Last year, remember how loud it was? Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to try to fix that. That may cost a few bucks, too, so I just want to let you know about that. But again, we want to make it a place that's irresistible to people, so they'll want to come. We're going to be adding some additional lighting and design elements in here to enhance everybody's weekend experience because we want you to just love it here and want to invite friends so they can come hear the good news of Jesus, okay? That's what we want to do. So lots of stuff going on in the church, and I hope you'll plug in and help in any way that you can. But now, I went through this long, long list, and why, why did I go through this long list? What is all this that I've just thrown up on you for the last 30 minutes? I don't know the way you see it, but I see it as a constant and steady pursuit of God 
to call hearts to himself. To call the hearts of men and women and children, young adults of all ages, all types, to himself through Jesus Christ. He has chosen us to reconcile people back to him. And we're using our creative endeavors and all that we know how to do to create an environment that relationships with Jesus would deepen. They would start, and if they've already started, that they would deepen. That's why we're here. All religion, and no matter I don't, if you want to call Christianity a religion or not, that we have a committee on it, okay? But all religion perceived as good or bad or false or true, it consists of rules and standards and guidelines and dress codes and dietary laws, just kind of stuff that you got to do or, or, or stuff that you don't have to do so you can be on the in crowd. You know, there's the, there's the in crowd and then there's those people out there. And all these religions have these rules, okay? But that's not Christianity. That, that is not Christianity. Let me tell you what Christianity, let me tell you a little bit about Christianity. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul tells his young disciple Timothy, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to seek sinners. In Luke he says, to seek and save, that is why I came. In Romans 5.8 it says, Christ saves us while we were still sinners. Let me ask you a question here. Is it you or is it Jesus doing the pursuing here? Jesus Christ is not telling you to go clean up. Jesus Christ is not telling you, you have to do this and then I'll love you. Jesus Christ says, you're not doing any of this and I love you anyway and I'm in hot pursuit of your heart. That's Jesus Christ and that is Christianity. It's a beautiful story of a God that lovingly pursues his creation. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in all of scripture, for God so loved the world, all the people that are not pursuing him, all the ones who are active, present, rebellion against him, he still sent his son because he loves you. He's on a mission, he's proactive, he's coming to get you. So what we've been studying through this series of absolute authority of the miracles of Jesus, it's not just some mystical stuff like, wow, he can do this and he can do that. That's an incredible story. That makes for a really good movie, but that's not what it's about. It's not some, you know, ethereal thing like heavenly, oh, incredible thing. Okay, it's, it's, it's power. It's pursuit. Jesus healing the blind. Jesus healing the leper. Jesus casting out demons. Jesus uh, quieting a storm. Jesus multiplying the five loaves of bread and two fish to feed seven to ten thousand people on the grassy hill. These are not just wow, cool things that he did. This is the constant pursuit of Jesus Christ to win the hearts of men and women across the world. He's, it's not just to put on a show. It is awesome. I'm not taking anything away from the miracles of Jesus. It is amazing to, to read these stories and envision what had happened. To be there would be incredible. But that's not the end game. The, the real reason why he's doing this, why is to build Christ-centered confidence in people. That you would love him more. That you would trust him more. That you would worship him greater. That you would serve him more. That's why he's doing it. He's building his church through this pursuit. That's what he's doing. And so he puts us on mission. And he says at the end of Matthew, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. And so therefore, confidently, confidently go and make disciples. Live this Christian life out as I have laid out in scripture before you. Live this thing out boldly, confidently. Because I am who I am. Because I've done this stuff. This is who I am. I'm Jesus, God of gods. You can go with confidence and do this. But before you go, you need to know some stuff. I mean, I, I, I've been going for a while. I've been going for a lot of years now. But I didn't always go. I needed to know some stuff first. You know what I'm saying? It started out with me with just a, just a curiosity. Like some of you were born and raised in the church, you got saved when you popped 
knocked out a mom. The, the Sunday school teacher was in on their flannel board in the room waiting for you to come out. <laughs> right? Join our class. No, join our class. Our class is better. They're not even believers in their class. Come to our class. But that wasn't like that for me. I was far from God, an enemy of God, just ugly, rotten, stinking thing. But I started, I was curious. And, and when I was curious, man, did Jesus show up? You know why? Because he's seeking people. He's pursuing people. I was far from God, but he showed up. People start coming out of the woodwork. They want to teach me about Jesus. Tell me about this Jesus guy. Bibles were showing up on my desk. And devotionals and tapes. I had tapes back then. And tapes were showing up on my, it was back in the Flint more days. And they, the tapes were showing up on my desk. I didn't want to teach me about Jesus. I told you this before. I felt like I was like in, a, in the ring with Mike Tyson. You know, boom, boom, you want to know about me? Boom, 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 I'll tell you about me. Here I am, buddy. And listen, you're in the ring right now. Boom, 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 boom. Every week, miracle after miracle, proof after proof, confidence over confidence, the evidence that Jesus Christ is God. And you are in the ring, and he's hammering you. That's why you're here. And that's what we're going to continue to do every single week. Jesus is still on mission right now, right here, in this place, on you to seek and save. Now let me tell you something. The decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life and to be devoted to him is wise. It's wise. Let me tell you why it's wise. There's a lot of reasons I can tell you why it's wise, but this is a big reason. At the end of the, of the commission... It's not because I can do miracles. It's not because I can walk on water. It's not because I can multiply bread. It's not because I can make a blind guy see. Let me tell you why it's such a wise decision. At the very end, what does he say? I will be with you. That's the grand prize. That's what you're seeking. This privilege of everlasting life with God. Nobody can say, nobody can do, nobody can help you with. It's that he will be with you. That you can be with him. Not someday up in the clouds, but right now. And then something will be That you get to be with God forever. That's the jewel. That's the pearl of great value. That's the most important thing you can ever have in your life. Is this promise that God would be with you Always. That's power. And this miracle we're about to study, this paints such a beautiful, beautiful picture of this reality, that God is with you. The, the, the miracle of, of Jesus walking on water, I would venture to say that it's probably the second most famous miracle in, 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 in Jesus' repertoire. Second only to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like, you got, a, you got a holiday out of that one. You got Easter, right? You got Easter, we can trash that with Easter money, right? We got Christmas, we ruined that with Santa Claus. What would we ruin Walk on Water Day with? I don't even know. Would it be like, I don't know, some mystery dragon, like on a like Pegasus or something? I don't know what we would do to ruin it, but that, that, that day doesn't, we don't have a day for that. We don't have a walk on water day, although if you guys want to have that for our church, that would be awesome. People would want to come here. Yeah? But we don't have anything like that. You know what's amazing about I was reading this, uh, Matthew 14, we're going to read this now. I was reading it this week. You know about you? When I read it, I suffer from reductionism. I read that Jesus walked on water, and it just doesn't... Yeah, but you just read my Bible and he walked on the water. He came through them walking on the water. And you're just like, who stops right there and just like falls on their knees and goes, you should. Let me just, let me just pause for a second. Jesus broke all the laws of physics and he walked on the water. That is so freaking cool. Does anyone get this? He walked on water. Like you read it and it's like four little words in this book. And so it's like no big deal. He walked on water. That's insane, right? So I want you to be thinking about this as we read this. Jesus, he, he freaks people out. Jesus freaks people out all the time. He freaks people out now all the time. You know, he, he, like we believe in God, right? People, do you know that 70% of this country say that they're Christians, they, like, they believe in God? 
That's growth. This is good. Let's keep it up, okay? But Jesus freaks people out. He freaked them out so much back then that they killed him. He freaks out people now so much that they want to ignore him and tell us to shut up and talk about him. I'll believe in God. But then Jesus, like if you, you're okay with Jesus, but you got a problem with the Bible because Jesus in the Bible says, hey, you know that God that you guys all like worship and talk about that you believe in? Yeah, he and I are the same. Like if you've seen me, you've seen him. That he and I were one. Like that freaks people out. Like they're okay with God being God. But they're not okay when Jesus says, I'm that God. And that's what people suffer with in this country. They don't like that whole Jesus. They never like that whole Jesus thing. People are ashamed of it. They're scared of it. Because this guy claims that he is God. And that freaks people out. Let's read this, okay? While we're going, I want to say something. But, but, but in, in, in Psalms, here's a couple verses as you go, as you open up your Bible. In Psalms, this is some like I, I guess some like ethereal statement, like some um, hypothetical. This is kind of what God says stuff. Like it's not in red. It's not Jesus saying it. We know that the scriptures are Holy Spirit inspired, so therefore it really was written by God. But it's kind of out of somebody else's mouth. I and mean, let's just be honest. This way people think, right? So in the Psalms. It says in Psalm 32, 8, I will guide you, advise you, and watch over you. God, right? God will do this. In Psalm 33, 13, and 14, God says, I see you and I understand you. So we're cool with that. In Psalm 34, 17, he says, I hear your cry for help and I rescue you. So these are the claims of God. And no one really has a problem with that. They're like, oh, that'd be nice. But then you get to Matthew 14. And Jesus does those things. And that's where people get stumbled. That's where they stumble. That's where it freaks them out. They're okay with this broad brush of some God statement of this is what I'll do. But when Jesus does those things, that's what freaks them out. Matthew 14, starting at verse 22. Immediately after this, this is asked, immediately after he multiplied the food and fed, fed all those people. Immediately after this, we're talking about boom, boom, boom. Like that wasn't enough. Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Well, he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy wind waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. So you guys go, oh, wow. That's incredible, right? That was a bad wow. I just want to let you know. That was a growth. Do you want to try it again? Okay, let's hear it. Wow! That's more like it. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they probably said the same thing too, right? But probably in a different tone. When they saw him walking on the water, okay, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? He walked on the water. Mother's Jewish and she studies the Old Testament. She believes in God. See, the thing is that Jesus says that that God that you believe in, Joanne, he and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen him. And she denies that. Let me share something with you that I found this week that is awesome. Her Bible in the Old Testament book of Job, in Job 9 8, it says that God alone marches on the waves of the sea. That's the same. And Jesus marched 
on the waves of the sea, and only God can do that. See, God is the one who will guide you and advise you and watch over you. He will see you and he will understand you. That's scary. And he will hear your cry for help and he will rescue you. And you just read in that story that Jesus Christ did exactly that. And that's what freaks people out about Jesus. He is God, okay? Jesus Christ is God. He alone will march on the sea. Jesus Christ did this, okay? It's not a, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He does, but he doesn't need to. The Bible itself says that he is. Only God will march upon the waves of the sea, and Jesus Christ does. The, the power of the miracle, like, I don't want to take away from the, the awe value of this guy walking on water because it's incredible. But the real power in the, in the miracle is not the actual miracle itself like we've been talking about for weeks and weeks now, okay? The power of the miracle is the display that Jesus truly does see where you are, that he truly does evaluate your real need, and that he really does come to you with loving help. That's who Jesus Christ is. And that's why this miracle happened. It wasn't just to save this, these people from dying. There was a purpose behind the miracle. It was to fulfill that which was said in the Psalms about, I will advise you, I will watch over you, I see you, I understand you, I, I, and I will hear your cry for help, and I will come to you to rescue you. One of the great things about Jesus is that he truly does evaluate your great need. And the great need to most of us, as we read this, would probably be like, well, they're about to die. It's a strong storm. And so we're like that too. Jesus, I'm in trouble. I need some help with this issue in my life. Come help me. And you want him to deliver on that promise. That's the Jesus you've created. But the Jesus of the Bible is a little bit different. The Jesus of the Bible evaluates your very need. Much like we saw in the last miracle where he says to the people, you follow me because I fed you. Because we think that our, our basic needs are food and water and shelter and clothing. These are the things that we very, we at least need this. And Jesus is like, no, you don't. Why would you even think about things that are perishable? Seek me, seek me, seek me. You, what, non-believers, they, they dwell on that stuff. That's not your basic need. You know what your basic need is? Me. You need me. That's all you need. Much like the rich young ruler, you read about him in the scripture, and he comes to Jesus and he says, I've done all the rules, I've done all the rules, I've done all the rules, what am I going to do to be a real Christian? And so what does Jesus say? Okay, I've got another couple of rules you've got to follow. He's like, no, you don't need any more rules. I need your heart. I don't need your, you don't need to follow the rules. I need your heart. Change your perspective. Sell all your stuff and follow me. He's like, no, I can't do that. He knew what that guy needed. It wasn't just to follow the rules is to follow the Spirit. It's to follow Jesus. Much like the cripple did that gets lower down through the roof. If you were, if you were or you knew the crippled person for 30 years and, and they were crippled, what would you say his greatest need would be? Logic would tell us that it would be he wants to be healed. Right? If you've got a cold and you've been sick for two weeks, what do you think the most, the, the most pressing need in your life is? I want to get better. So this guy's crippled. And so they bring him to Jesus and they lower him through the roof. And what does Jesus do? Does he heal him? No. Because he knows what that person really needs. He sees in that heart of that man. He says, no, you're, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about you being paralyzed. I'll get to that. Good solution. Your sins are forgiven. He knows what we really need. And he comes after us. And so what is Jesus trying to do here in this miracle? What's he trying to accomplish here? Is he just trying to save them in a storm? Is that the purpose of the miracle? To show off? I can walk on water. I can help you. That's not really it. Look at verse 27. Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Why? I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you. You're going to drown. You're going to die. I'm going to save you. Temporal, temporal. Is that it? That's not it. Down to verse 31. He tells us what he's going to save him from. from. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Was it to save him? There's so little faith. Jesus spoke to this guy's heart. He's coming after this guy's heart. And he's coming after yours. You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? 
Why did you doubt me? I will be with you. I hear your cry for help. I see where you are. I know your great needs. I am with you. I will take care of you. Why did you doubt me? Who cares about dying? Do you know some of you are going to die this year? Like that's not news, right? Could happen to me. Some of you are going to get cancer, and maybe someone in this room, someone you know, is going to get cancer and like die. Could be me. Is he going to save me from that? Maybe. Will you pray for me? I hope. But maybe he doesn't. But I want him with me. I think it was John Wesley that said on his deathbed, the greatest thing is that God is with me. And he was dying. That's all that matters. Is that he's with me. And that reality just changes my whole life. It permeates my thoughts, my feelings, my perspective, my worldview. It changes everything to know that God is with me all the time. Over in John's account of this miracle, it says that these guys had rowed out three to four miles out into the middle of this lake. It was nighttime, strong winds, heavy waves. And look, remember I said don't underestimate, don't, don't underevaluate this whole walking on water thing? Like that's incredible. Think about this for a second. Okay, he's out there, it's nighttime, he's up on the hill, there's a storm, so it's probably not crystal clear with the moon shining down on the lake where he can see everything. The normal man would struggle to see just off the shore in that condition, but three to four miles out into the middle of the lake, in the storm, Jesus comes directly, pinpoint precision, right to where they are. Like, I didn't think much of that until I realized that the Sea of Galilee is 1.79 billion square feet. Do you understand how big that is? Do, okay, that, who's ever been to Disney? Now, imagine if you will, okay? Imagine if you will. I'm not talking about just the Magic Kingdom. I'm talking about Epcot, the, the, the Animal Planet, or whatever it is, the Animal Kingdom. Uh, the, 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 the MGM Studios, all the resorts, all their lakes, every piece of that entire property, okay? If, if that place was empty, and I went hiding in there someplace by myself and said, Cindy, come find me. You think she'd have any luck? Have you ever gone to Disney and tried to find somebody? <laughs> Disney is 1.1 billion square feet. It's the size of San Francisco. 1.79 billion square feet is Eustis in its entire acreage times four. Now plop someone down in the middle of the night in a hurricane and go find them. Where's Waldo? That's what you'd be doing. And Jesus Christ comes down off the mountain, pinpoint precision, and he's right into their presence to do exactly what the Bible says. I will see you, I understand your fears, I can hear your cry for help, and I will rescue you. Why? Because I am with you. That's the reason of, for the miracle of walking on water. So here's where God wants to talk to you personally. Okay, now this one's for you. When you accept his gift of eternal life on the cross, the grand prize is that you and him get to be together forever. That is the grand prize. Seek it. Don't stumble around, fumble around looking at the consolation prizes of what Jesus can do for you or what he can save you from. That's a big one. It's that you get to be with him forever. I will walk with you, I will talk with you, I will provide for you, I will protect you. I know your needs. I understand your fears. I know that you're prone to wander. One of the most beautiful things, but one of the most scary things is that he understands you. See, I don't know about you, but I don't really want him to understand me. Because the things I think about are not things I really want Jesus to know I'm thinking about. Do you know what I'm saying? Am I the only one? Yeah. Pretty full room with that. I don't really want Jesus to know what I'm thinking about. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, as opposed to the ugly thing about me, is that if I knew some of the things you were thinking about about me, I probably wouldn't want to be your friend. 
But Jesus knows the things you think about. He knows every little deep, dark, ugly secret in the nooks and crannies of your black heart. <laughs> and he loves you anyway. That's crazy, right? He pursues you anyway, even though it's ugly. He knows your heart. He knows your fears. He knows what you're thinking. And he chooses to lovingly pursue you anyway. So there's two reasons why we're doing this study of Jesus' miracles. It's for the believer who's, who's decided to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life, but they're kind of stumbling along. They feel a little bit low. They need a bump. Know this. If you say yes to him, he's with you. You don't need to pray out, you don't need to pray to some far off Jesus up in the heavens. He's in your chest cavity. He's right here. He is with you. And if you're swimming around in your world in the storm, and you, you gotta like, what's your heavy wave? Yes. What's the heavy wave? What's the heavy wave's name? What's the strong wind in your life? That's got you scared. That's got you crying out for help. Like, name that thing and give it to him. And let him find you in the middle of your sea of Galilee. Because his promises that you know. And, and if you're not saved, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't know, maybe you haven't. Some people here, I don't know you. I have no idea. <coughs> Listen, this is not, Christianity is not a religion. That says you've got to do some stuff or stop doing some stuff to, to be in the crowd. Jesus is pursuing you. That's why you're here. He's, you're here because he drew you to himself because he wanted to talk to you tonight. Hopefully he's using this foolish man to talk to you tonight. He's pursuing you. He's telling you you don't have to clean up. You, you can be saved as filthy and rotten as, as you are right now. God sent his son to die while you were a sinner. So you don't have to clean up first. You just need to come to him and say, thank you, this one who walks on water. And just say yes. Start your relationship with him. Really, that's what this church is all about. You want to help you start a relationship with Jesus? So you with him. And let's be heedless. Let's enjoy all that he would have for us. Do you know what I mean? Let's enjoy that. And if you've, if you've said yes to Jesus already, but you need a bump, just remember that Jesus, not only did he walk on water, not only did he save them, but he met them exactly where they were. Out in a lake that was 1.79 billion square feet. In the middle of a storm. He knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly what they needed. He came to them and rescued them. ask the gentleman to come forward and give communion. You'll hold on to those elements and we'll take it together as a family. <coughs> we'll ask you to pray for you now. Lord God, we thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word. Thank you for the patience of these beautiful people allowing the opportunity to talk a little bit about the church tonight. I hope and pray that you'll use this to uh, just help people find a home. Every person is longing for a relationship. We all know that. We all feel that. We have something special here that we've done. We've created a great place where people can love each other. Great friendships in the way. I've experienced it. We all have. And it's, it's really, really special. It took me a long time to, 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 to get used to that. You know, when I got saved, Lord, when you saved me, I was in a church that was filled with good friends and there was a lot of family there. And, and it took years for me to get over the fact that that closed. And even in my own church, I didn't feel comfortable. But over these last few years, you've done a tremendous work. Thank you for the privilege of these relationships and having these people. Lord, thank you for being a God that just comes to us where we are. When we feel like the waves are crashing over us, and we feel like maybe we can't, we say we don't know what to do. Help us to always remember this. That you are a God who sees us who understands us, who knows our fears, who knows that we're prone to wander, 